The consequences of the climate crisis are already being felt across the world, like in the Pacific, where small island states are threatened by rising sea levels. With me today is Ambassador Samuelo Lalonio. He is the special representative, special envoy of the government of Tuvalu, which is one of those states in the Pacific. Um, and you're here to call on decision makers in Germany to make the future of the Pacific Island states um, a core issue of Germany's climate foreign policy. Um, Mr. Ambassador, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to DW today. Um, scientists believe that several Pacific Island nations, including Tuvalu, will be submerged by water within the next few decades. How does your country, how does Tuvalu prepare for its literal demise? Well, um, many ways. I mean, if you are a country that's looking at issues of um, sovereignty, statelessness, you know, losing your way of life, uh, we use uh, all that is within our disposal to ensure that uh, we are able to remain, you know, in our islands and, and continue uh, the way we have uh, lived. Uh, over the past 3,000 years. So uh, priority now is uh, we are investing a lot in building our resilience and our capacity to adapt to the uh, impact of the climate crisis, uh, in particular sea level rise. And how are um, the rising sea levels impacting, affecting your country already? Well, it's uh, directly affecting, I, I mean, uh, compromising our water and food security as well as our health security. So I, I say that uh, the climate crisis and sea level rise is affecting all sectors of development to the point that uh, you know, we, we see the climate crisis as the greatest challenge in our efforts to achieve uh, sustainable development. You're saying it is affecting all sectors. What, um, what can the people of Tuvalu do about that to mitigate those effects? Well, um, as I said, uh, since our priority now is to build resilience uh, and you know, uh, enhance our capacity to uh, adapt. Um, so uh, as we speak, we are implementing in Tuvalu uh, the biggest project, adaptation project that we have ever uh, implemented. Uh, and it is a green climate fund uh, project. And it requires the reclamation of our coastal areas, uh, but also raised, you know, we have raised it and reclaimed at the same time. Uh, that project will um, add about 10% of the existing um, habitable uh, land area. So uh, the, ob the objective really is to, and, and the only option, uh, I think, viable options to, to be able to uh, remain uh, in our islands is to raise uh, our land and reclaim. That is, other, there are some other uh, options we are taking in terms of resilience, but uh, the most important now is to wherever we can raise the land and reclaim it. Um, you're saying it, the people in Tuvalu are already living with the reality of the climate crisis, have been living with them for decades. What can other countries learn in terms of adaptation and resilience from Tuvalu and its people? Well, I think there's uh, uh, understanding. People do understand uh, what the impacts of climate change are. It's affecting different countries in different ways. But I think it's more important now, and it's part of our, our message uh, during this trip, is that people need to understand that it is about real people, uh, you know, and real lives. Uh, however, we are impacted, uh, but there are people on Atoll Nations that are in the forefront, of the forefront of climate change. You know, we are staring at uh, the existential uh, threats, climate change. We are grappling with the questions of uh, sta statelessness, sovereignty, the risk of losing our way of life, our rights. So those are, I think, 
there's a need for people to understand the human aspects, the human face of the climate crisis. Yeah, you're talking about this existential threat to your people. Have a lot of people in Tuvalu already left the islands and have moved somewhere else, migrated away? Well, um, there is uh, visibly uh, people are migrating. Uh, there are, you know, it's a private decision. It's not a policy of the government to uh, even consider uh, relocation. But clearly there are people uh, uh, migrating uh, for various reasons, looking for education for their children. But certainly there are people migrating because they have lost lands uh, due to coastal erosion. And, uh, and in general, the, you know, the uncertainty because of uh, the, the impacts of climate change. And is the government of Tuvalu helping those people migrate or setting incentives somehow? Yes, uh, what the government is doing is um, building the capacity of its people to be able, wherever they go to, whether that is, well, so far as private decisions of them to move, to have that skills, uh, for, for instance, uh, education, uh, qualifications, uh, trainings, upskilling our people, so that they can establish themselves outside of Tuvalu, should they go, uh, you know, should they migrate because of climate crisis. And what kind of time frame are you working with? Is the government of Tuvalu working with? Is there going to be a relocation of all inhabitants of, of the islands necessary? Um, you said it's not, it's not government policy at the moment. Yes. Um, you, yeah, I, I've said it. Um, you know, the, the issue of uh, relocation, or if you like, forced displacement, is not a, an option now. Uh, we and the government is uh, focusing on as I said, the building resilience and the capacity to uh, remain where we are. You are in Tuvalu and other. If not all, the majority of them would rather not uh, move uh, elsewhere. Uh, complicated questions when you have to move. Still, um, what does it mean for a state to or a nation to potentially lose its physical territory? How is Tuvalu preparing for that? Well, um, unimaginable that uh, situation. Um, we are now you know, following closely the discussions of, uh, for example, the issue of uh, losing uh, territories. The purpose of our trip is also to bring that message. You know, we, for instance, we value the reception that we have, we have received in the capitals that we travel, including Berlin where we ask uh, for their support uh, uh, in the, the discussion on the issue of, uh, of the permanency of uh, maritime zones, for, for instance, you know, how baseline changes, because that would affect certainly the state, uh, state or statelessness of uh, our people. Uh, we have made our case clear, not only to all, but as a region where we would rather have uh, permanent uh, baselines, maritime baseline, regardless of sea level rise. Uh, so those are, you know, the discussion in the international legal forums, including the UN. We have uh, asked our development partners, our friends like German, to help us in those discussions. Yeah, let's talk about these international partners. Um, now, small island nations in the Pacific, like Tuvalu, have historically contributed least to global warming and CO2 emissions, yet they bear the brunt of the effects of climate change, as you've outlined very clearly. Um, what do you expect from your international partners? What are your concrete demands? Well, our uh, concrete demand has not changed over the years, as we have always, always been vocal in the, in the COP process. Uh, we are determined to keep the 1.5 target. Uh, central to that is the issue of fossil fuel. Uh, we are actively engaged in discussion on the non-proliferation of fossil fuel. Uh, and we seek uh, the help and the understanding and uh, 
the commitment of our development partners on that front. At all nations, you know, uh, time is not on our side. Uh, total inundation within the century. And if we are serious about uh, sea level rise, we have to address the problem at the source. And, you know, fossil fuel is the greatest source of, of what climate crisis and, and sea level rises. Yeah, your foreign minister um, gave a video, sent a video message to the climate conference uh, where he's standing knee deep in the ocean. It went viral. You said it, you've been advocating for the plight of, of the countries in the Pacific, the small island states for decades now um, and have been saying the same messages over and over again. Do you feel like the world is really taking you seriously? I think it's a... Uh... It's a question of, uh, of, you know, staying the course. Uh, I think we we don't have an, another option other than to keep on, uh, you know, bringing these measures and talking to our friends, development past international community. Um, I can say that uh, during this trip, we are very much encouraged by the discussion we've had in, for example, Geneva, Copenhagen, Paris as well as in, in um, Germany. So we are encouraged and uh, there's only one way forward and our only option is to, to keep on beating the drum, I can say that. Um, speaking about staying on course, Germany, historically, it's the fourth largest emitter of CO2 and it's set to fail its climate targets once again. How does, how does that make you feel being here? Well, um, makes it more important to be here, you know, uh, to talk to, uh, because we do, recognize how, you know, the pivotal role that Germany can play in this struggle to address climate change. Uh, so you have to talk to, you know, to people who make, can make a difference. Uh, and, and Germany is certainly, uh, you know, uh, an important uh, uh, partner in this. And with uh, the assistance that we can get from Germany, it will also, uh, you know, uh, uh, it will be something to, for others uh, to follow. Uh, we understand uh, the situation in Germany in terms of, as you have clearly, and we, we understand and we, we also believe in the just transition uh, to renewable energy. Uh, so we have, we have avenues to address uh, if, for instance, uh, a quick uh, uptake of technology, renewable energy, uh, into value. We, we are hopeful that uh, you know we can uh, remain in, in, in where we are. Europe at the moment is having a debate on um, radical climate protests. Um, protesters who are gluing themselves to the streets, blocking critical infrastructure um, to protest their governments in action. What do you say about these protests? Are they necessary? Well, uh, I think it's very, very necessary. I think it is, uh, is to make sure that uh, people who can influence the discussions and the actions on climate, the climate actions, are you know kept on the uh, alert uh, and attention on, on the critical issue of climate change. No, this is a complex uh, world with different uh, issues that have e uh, security issues and so forth. But it's important that we get keep that attention on the climate crisis. So, yeah, the protests, I, I think, is something that be part of our efforts to ensure that we, we don't lose our focus on the, I think, most important challenge of our time. Mr. Ambassador, thank you so much for the interview. Thank you. Thank you for having me.